Give me a decent bottle of poison and I'll construct the perfect crime. Today on the Medical Humanities Podcast, the poisons and poisoners of Agatha Christie. Dame Agatha Christie is one of the most famous writers in the world, second only to Shakespeare in terms of number of works sold. The Queen of Crime was prolific and wildly creative, and invented storytelling devices and locked room mysteries that had rarely, if ever, been seen before. She created memorable detectives like Hercule Poirot and Miss Marple, to name her two most famous sleuths, and adaptations of her work continue today. This coming September, 2023, Kenneth Branagh will again assume the role of Poirot in a film called A Haunting in Venice, based on Christie's 1969 novel, Halloween Party. And while Christie's work includes a fair amount of violent murder methods, including stabbings, shootings, blunt force trauma, etc., she is perhaps best known for her use of poison. Nearly 30 novels see the hapless victims dispatched via poisons of many kinds, and even more include non-fatal poisons or sleeping drafts as part of the plot. So why so many poisonings? Isn't it easier to have the villain fire off a weapon or bash someone's head in with a bat? It turns out that the subject of poisons was very familiar to Agatha Christie, and in part, is responsible for her even beginning to write in the first place. There are a few spoilers in this episode. I don't reveal who the killers are, but I do discuss the manner of death, which can be part of the surprise. So, if you aren't familiar with her body of work, but plan to read some of her novels, you might want to skip this episode. It all started in 1914. 24-year-old Agatha Christie, nee Agatha Mary Clarissa Miller, was newly married and living in the town of her birth, Torquay, England. War had broken out, and Agatha, like many other women, volunteered as a nurse with the British Red Cross. Her new husband, Archie, signed on as a pilot with the Royal Flying Corps. After a bout with the flu that kept Agatha away from the hospital for a month, it was suggested that she start working in the newly opened dispensary. We'd probably call it the pharmacy these days. The hours were better, and she was able to work with her friends, and so she spent the next two years learning how to dispense medications for medical officers and doctors. Although she found the work interesting, she wrote in her biography published in 1977 that she had been much happier as a nurse that it was her calling, even, and that she wouldn't have wanted to work in the dispensary permanently. The world should be eternally grateful for whichever flu virus infected Mrs. Christie, or whatever caprice of fate steered her towards the dispensary, because if she hadn't taken up that particular position, we may never have heard of Agatha Christie at all. This is because, according to the dame herself, She often found herself bored during downtimes among the medicines, and it was during one of these moments of idle ennui that she began to think about writing a detective novel. A couple of years before, her older sister, Madge, who was a writer herself, had stated fairly bluntly that Agatha wouldn't be capable of writing a detective novel. So the seed had been sown, Agatha wrote in her autobiography. She'd remained determined to prove her sister wrong. The boredom of the dispensary proved to be just the right kind of soil in which that seedling of an idea could grow. I began considering what kind of detective story I could write. Since I was surrounded by poison, perhaps it was natural that death by poisoning should be the method I selected. For her first foray into crime fiction, she chose strychnine as the means of murder. Strychnine is a powerful neurotoxin that causes convulsions and eventual death due to asphyxia 
along with lactic acidosis and rhabdomyolysis, when inhaled, ingested, or absorbed through the eyes or mouth. It works by preventing the inhibitory effects of glycine on the postsynaptic neuron, which just means that without these things, action potentials are triggered with much less stimulus than is typically required. This results in intense muscle spasms that occur with the slightest of stimuli. In the past, sufferers were often kept in the dark, in quiet rooms, to limit any stimulus that would bring on the ravages of painful, protracted muscle contractions. Sometimes even opisthotonus, those dramatically arched back pictures you've seen, usually found in tetanus sufferers. It's a terrible way to die, but ideal for a dastardly murder in Agatha's first book. Once the method of death was decided upon, she spent weeks assembling a cast of characters, basing some upon neighbors and even fellow tram passengers, and determined that she would have to create a memorable detective like Sherlock Holmes, capable of unraveling the most ingenious of murders. She envisioned her detective as a fastidious, peculiar little man, and gave him a buffoon of a sidekick as a foil. Local Belgian refugees inspired her in part to invent Hercule Poirot, and to name him as grandly as Conan Doyle had named Sherlock and Mycroft Holmes. She originally wanted to call him Hercules, but opted for the French version as it, quote, sounded better with Poirot. She knew she had to equip him with an abundance of, quote, little gray cells with which to solve the case. Soon, the mysterious affair at Styles was completed and sent off to several publishers, all of whom rejected it outright. It languished for two years before being accepted for publication, after which it was generally very well received. One of Agatha's favorite reviews came from the pharmaceutical journal who praised her by saying, this detective story deals with poisons in a knowledgeable way and not with the nonsense about untraceable substances that so often happens. Miss Agatha Christie knows her job. Well, she was hooked. She would go on to write 66 novels, 166 short stories, 27 plays and scripts, 7 radio plays, poetry, autobiographies, and six romance novels under the name Mary Westmacott. Her various works have sold over two billion copies. Only Shakespeare and the Bible have sold more. Poison has a certain appeal, she wrote in her novel, They Do It With Mirrors. It has not the crudeness of the revolver bullet or the blunt instrument. So which poisons would an experienced dispensary chemist employ when writing a murder mystery? Aside from strychnine, she had a host of other compounds to choose from, and used several of them repeatedly, cyanide being the most common. It was used to dispatch victims in the mirror cracked from side to side, and then there were none, a pocket full of rye, and sparkling cyanide. Cyanide is derived from the seeds of the prunus family, which includes cherries, apricots, and almonds. Even apple seeds contain trace amounts of it, but fortunately most people are able to handle small quantities of the stuff without suffering the ill effects. It's when larger amounts are introduced to the body that things get ugly. Cyanide prevents mitochondria from using oxygen to make ATP, adenosine triphosphate, an organic compound vital to many processes, including creating energy. Without ATP, nerve cells and cardiac cells, among others, quickly use up all their energy and die. And when enough of them die, the entire organism, i.e. the poisoning victim, dies too. Onset of symptoms is rapid if the dose is large enough, and death follows quite quickly. In spy movies, secret agents sometimes resort to swallowing a cyanide capsule when on the verge of capture, which would certainly do the trick. Half a gram of cyanide will kill a 160-pound adult in moments, which makes for some dramatic death scenes. Christie was also intrigued by the properties of other substances, too, such as arsenic, digitalis, and nicotine, 
along with rarer poisons like thallium, used in the novel The Pale Horse, taxine, used in A Pocket Full of Rye, conine, derived from hemlock, the same substance that killed Socrates, used in Five Little Pigs, and even anthrax in Cards on the Table. She used medicinal plants, such as the neurotoxic monk's hood in 450 from Paddington, and belladonna from the deadly nightshade plant, used in The Caribbean Mystery and The Big Four. Conine, nicotine, and thallium are toxic to the nervous system and eventually cause muscular paralysis, among other symptoms. Digitalis and taxine are cardiotoxins, and inhalation anthrax is a deadly bacteria that affects the lungs. And here's an interesting little tidbit. Belladonna means beautiful lady in Italian, and was so named by taxonomist Carl Linnaeus in the mid-18th century. He knew that fashionable women of Renaissance Italy used eye drops made from the juice of the deadly nightshade plant, which contains atropine. They used it to dilate their pupils, as they believed large pupils made them more alluring. An optometrist today still use atropine to dilate pupils when examining the eye. But back to Christy and her poisons. Ironically, the antidote for belladonna poisoning, physostigmine, was also used itself as a poison in Crooked House. Like in many other crime novels, morphine and sleeping pills also feature heavily. Sad Cypress, Death Comes as the End, Lord Edgware Dies, but the ultimate ode to the many and varied poisons has to be Curtain, which, spoiler alert, someone quite important dies. In that one story, characters are killed with morphine, physostigmine, sleeping pills, and ultimately by not using amyl nitrate. One of the very best sources of information on the various poisons that feature in Agatha Christie's works is 2015's A is for Arsenic by Catherine Harkup. If you're a fan of Christie and intrigued by poisons, this book will educate and entertain, and it's a fascinating read. However, as Harkup herself points out, Christie did not expect readers to have advanced medical or pharmaceutical knowledge. And in fact, those who did know their way around an apothecary did not have an advantage over lay readers in figuring out who the culprit was. Christie knew her poisons, but made sure to describe them in clear, plain English. Perhaps the only criticism one could offer is how unlikely it is that so many killers were familiar with obscure poisons and how to dose them properly. It hardly matters, though. Once you suspend your disbelief and lose yourself in her compelling plots and tight prose, you simply accept that they do. After the break, poison as a woman's weapon. Reading through the various novels of Agatha Christie, it becomes apparent that more often than not, the poisoners are female. Poison has long been considered the domain of women, even stretching back into antiquity. In ancient Rome, several women were famous for their skills with poison, mostly to help women acquire wealth through the poisoning of successive husbands, but in some cases to escape abusive marriages or to aid in political assassinations. Medieval women, with knowledge of herbs and medicinal plants, were often accused of poisoning village wells or causing the untimely deaths of those who had offended them, and were thus quite often charged with witchcraft. Throughout the following centuries, notorious cases abounded of women poisoning their partners or elderly people in their care, most often for inheritance or insurance payouts. The French nickname for arsenic, by the way, is poudre de succession, inheritance powder. But there are more practical reasons that death by poison is often attributed to female killers, especially in crime fiction. Historically, preparing food and caring for the sick have been largely the domain of women. There are, for instance, a few male physicians in Christie's books, but if they turn out to be the murderer, they are as likely to shoot, stab, or bludgeon their victims as anyone else's, 
In other words, their medical knowledge seems to make no difference. They choose instead a violent physical end for the person they murder. Nurses, on the other hand, or caregivers responsible for administering medications, are invariably female in 1930s fiction. And unlike the male physicians, they choose poisons or opiates to get the job done. The same is true for cooks or any other female in charge of preparing food. It's a simple matter to introduce a dash of poison into the sandwich spread or the pre-dinner cocktails, mostly because in these books, and sometimes, sadly, in real life, hardly anyone pays attention to those responsible for domestic work. Poisoning is also a sly, obscure way of killing one's enemies. If you fire a gun at your foe, or slide a stiletto between their ribs, or conk them on the head with a lead pipe, you are, by necessity, confronting them as you do it. It takes mental fortitude and often physical strength to commit such crimes, whereas poison can be administered with a smile, or a kiss, or even a genuine alibi, and most importantly, with very little physical risk to yourself. Not many women can hold their own in a physical altercation with a man, and any prospective female murderer who attempts to smother or bludgeon or stab some unlucky fellow may find themselves overpowered. Poisoning requires brains, not brawn. And since it can be done at a distance and even over time, it may be seen as less violent and easier to accomplish as well. It's also worth remembering that when Christie was writing, toxic substances like arsenic and cyanide could be easily purchased over the counter to deal with pests and vermin. Would it have been easier for a woman to acquire some cyanide than a gun? You know, for a spot of gardening? Very likely. Is there also an element of prolonged suffering or an especially painful death when it comes to poison? Certainly anything other than opiates can provide horrible agonies and panicked death throes, but a well-placed letter opener or a hearty shove over the edge of a cliff is not without a certain degree of pain and panic either. In the end, it may be that a splash of something nasty in a bottle of beer or a clandestine overdose of morphine is simply a more believable means of murdering someone when the evildoer is a woman. Agatha Christie was a woman of her time, after all, when gender roles were more pronounced, and women were seen as more devious than physically threatening. Whatever the case, Christie's extensive knowledge of medicinal compounds added a certain exotic flavor to her works, and provided many more opportunities for clever murders than she might have been able to come up with otherwise. She was among the first writers to describe ricin as a murder weapon, long before it was known to have been used in real life. And her creative use of various gases, seeds, plants, flowers, made for some very compelling fiction. Her advanced knowledge and accurate descriptions even saved a baby in real life. In 1977, a nurse who had been reading Pale Horse recognized the symptoms of thallium poisoning in a young infant, based solely on the description of it in the novel. The baffled doctors agreed to test for it, having run out of answers themselves, and were shocked to discover the baby's body contained ten times the maximum allowable levels of thallium. It turned out that a common pesticide used to kill cockroaches contained thallium and had poisoned the baby without her parents having any idea of what was happening. After four months, the child was healthy enough to be discharged and return home. Poisons and sedatives provide a fascinating background for Agatha Christie's clever storytelling. Give me a decent bottle of poison, she said, and I'll construct the perfect crime. And she was right. We should be thankful, I guess, she limited her crimes to the pages of her novels. That's it for this episode. Join me next time for another fascinating look at medicine in history, culture, and the arts. <laughs>